Welcome to CIS 579 Technology of eBusiness. My name is Dr. Schusler, and this chapter is over e commerce security and fraud protection. After reading this chapter, you should have a better understanding of the importance and scope of security information systems for e commerce. You should be able to describe the major concepts and terminology of e commerce security. We're going to learn about the major e commerce e-commerce security threats, vulnerabilities, and technical attacks. You'll have a better understanding of internet fraud, phishing, and spam. You should be able to describe information assurance uh, uh, security principles. You should be able to identify and assess major technologies and methods for securing e-commerce access and communications. You'll be able to describe the major technologies for, for protection of e-commerce networks and describe various types of controls and special defense mechanisms. You'll be able to describe consumer and seller protection from fraud, describe the role of business continuity and disaster recovery planning, and, dis and discuss e-commerce security enterprise, uh, uh, securities enterprise implementation issues. And lastly, you'll understand why it is not possible to stop computer crimes. Security is a very broad field, a very very broad term, and a very broad field. Um, specifically, when we start to talk about information system security or computer security, um, it's at sometimes seemingly just as broad. Information security, for example, uh, is defined as protecting information and information systems from unauthorized access or disclosure, disruption, modification, perusal, inspection, recording, or destruction. So it's a pretty broad definition but the thing to wrap your mind around is the focus is on information, protecting that information. Um, a similar definition for computer security refers to the protection of data, networks, computer programs, computer power, and other elements of computerized information uh, information systems. So again, it's a very broad definition, but the focus shifts um, to include data, but also to include hardware devices as well. So security is a, is a broad field, and as we start to narrow it down, it becomes uh, we we can start to see certain specializations within the computer security field. What is e-commerce security? Well, this book kind of breaks down security into to two broad categories: uh, simply generic uh, um, security, really referring to to any information systems, and then e-commerce related, which is really focusing on on more of the uh, the e-commerce related side of things, attacks on e-commerce sites, identity theft, fraud, phishing, etc. This chapter covers both, but it really focuses more on the latter. Um, what is, uh, how do we go about determining what some of our security concerns are? Well, it's, it's really hard to do because a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but one organization that does try to shed light on it is the, the CAS or, or uh, a, a survey that comes out and reports information about that and tries to shed some light on that is the CSI Computer Crime and Security uh, Survey. Uh, this is put out in cooperation between the CSI and uh, the FBI. And this is something that they put out uh, annually and they try to release information about um, organizations and government agencies and, and talk about what the threats are, the problems that they're facing, and things like that. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't report computer crime. Uh, so as a result, any of the numbers that you see uh, posted by CSI all tend to be relatively low compared to what the true value probably is. Part of the information security problem is because it because it does cross and cover so many different domains. Uh, so it makes it very hard to make sure that when you're working on a particular security problem that everybody involved in, in solving that particular issue is focused on the domain in which you're working. Um, for example, personal security uh, in the personal security domain, we have to consider things that might affect our personal safety when we operate in an online environment, such as posting information to sites that might help sex offenders to to uh, um, find out information about uh, about us. Uh, fraud, identity theft, cyberbullying, these are all issues that we we need to consider when we're posting information on, on things like social networking sites uh, and things of the like. From a national security perspective or a national security domain, uh, we have to think about protecting our, our national infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, things like air travel and waterways and financial centers. 
so we make sure we have smooth and efficient functioning of those of those services as far as some of the more recent uh, or, or current security risks that we face according to baseline eWeek and security vendors uh, there's a variety of different different issues cyber espionage and cyber wars which we'll talk about a little bit more here in just a little bit there's attack on mobile assets things like our cell phones our smartphones uh, tablets etc attacks on social networks we were just kind of talking about that just a second ago um, our, our you know Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and, and those types of things cyber gangs attacks on new technologies such as cloud computing and virtualization as well as attacks on web applications as far as cyber war cyber espionage and cyber crimes across borders uh, there's the the book goes through all kinds of examples and, and if you get into that stuff by all means read that section in the book um, they give you a number of different examples of of these types of events such as uh, in, in December of 2010 the Iranian nuclear program being attacked by a computer program rumored to have been created here in the US and in Israel which really kind of crippled their nuclear program for a while uh, similar attacks launched against the United States from from North Korea both both against uh, the United States and South Korea uh, that tried to knock out a number of different sites so this this is happening more and more often and it's something that we have to be aware of as far as some of the types of attacks um, corporate espionage attacks and, and political espionage and warfare a um, couple of different kind of broad classes if you will um, keep in mind we as corporations put more and more online that means they become bigger and bigger targets or, or bigger and bigger bigger and bigger incentive for people to try to break in and steal intellectual property or transfer money uh, for example things like that um, and then the example but the Iranian nuclear program kind of falls into that political espionage and warfare category so exhibit 9.1 kind of gives you a, a graphical representation of, of what the major e-commerce security uh, management concerns were in 2011 um, topping the list fraud and e-commerce transactions uh, people basically just not representing what is really going on uh, this may be something like eBay for example somebody sells something that they don't really represent as being quite what it is uh, followed by prevention and detection of malware viruses worms trojans etc security strategy and sufficient budget you know especially with the economy turning down the way it, uh, the way it ha has been in the last few years that in some cases we don't have the money to do everything that we'd like to do and you can kind of play the rest of those out so what are some of the drivers of e-commerce security problems well there's a lot of different drivers to to some of the problems that we face in, in on the internet and in the e-commerce specifically but uh, some of the major ones or predominant ones if you will uh, revolve around just a few basic issues one of them uh, perhaps the foremost is is really the design of the internet uh, it was originally uh, originally designed really more as a proof of concept uh, the idea of just being able to get it to work um, and, and then the design kind of evolved from there and continued to build on this this proof of concept approach so security was never a, a real concern in the very, very early days of the internet and so this led to some vulnerabilities uh, specifically as it related to DNS the domain name system which translates or converts domain names into their numeric IP addresses um, and, and this is vulnerable that somebody can potentially remap that relationship so that when somebody types in a, a, a correct domain name so for example your bank chase.com or, or you know, bankofamerica.com those, those specific names that instead of going to the legitimate IP address it actually goes to a spoofed IP address and a, the, the wrong IP address um, in, in a foreign country or, or another place where uh, they collect your information, your login information, and they're able to log into your account and conduct transactions as, as they need to. Uh, the IP address is, is vulnerable itself, an address that uniquely identifies each computer connected to a network or the internet. And so the, those two systems, DNS and IP, have to work together. The motivations behind computer crimes have shifted as well. Uh, in the very early days of, of, of networking um, a lot of times hackers which is a term that's really kind of been misused over the years um, hackers were really oftentimes simply interested in discovering how devices worked how networks worked how the phone system worked 
Um, they weren't interested in profiting. They weren't interested in, in damaging the equipment or the machines. However, because of the amount of financial information and systems that we're putting online, that focus, that, that motivation for um, some of these crimes has shifted and become more profit-induced where it's simply too tempting that people feel like they, it's an easy way to profit. So that motivation has changed. This profit motivation has led to an internet under, underground economy, uh, places where people need to be able to seek out uh, potential buyers and sellers um, for information, for information about bank account numbers, uh, to be able to exchange bank account numbers and money, um, social security numbers, uh, passwords to various websites such as social networking sites or banking sites and, and things like that. So the, the this underground economy has basically become a place where, where people can come to bet together to be able to buy and sell that, that information. They get that information from a variety of different places. They capture those, those social security card numbers, uh, for example, and credit card numbers and all those types of things from a, in, in a variety of different ways. Um, one common way is through the use of keystroke logging or key logging. That's a method for capturing and rec recording keystrokes. So even if you happen to be accessing a secured website that encrypts your information as it's transmitted across the internet, um, it's really irrelevant when that information is captured using a keystroke logger because it's capturing the actual keys that you're typing on the keyboard uh, and then it sends the data either at that moment or at a later time to whoever's actually um, um, trying to capture that information. As far as the dynamic nature of e-commerce systems and the role of insiders, uh, one of the things to the, that you really have to keep in mind is that the vast majority of problems that we see are caused by insiders, and probably uh, roughly around half. Um, and because organizations are constantly adding uh, new employees, there's relatively high turnover with respect to employees constantly reintroducing security threats into an organization. So that's something to be aware of. Why is an e-commerce security strategy needed? Um, well, largely because attack strategies change all the time. They're changing their method. Uh, attackers are changing their methods all the time to address uh, network administrators who are constantly putting up new roadblocks uh, to be able to protect their systems. So these things are changing all the time. For example, um, a lot of attackers have shifted their focus from Windows PC based operating systems to other operating systems such as Android. Um, so so that it, it's creating quite a dilemma for network administrators because they have these huge workloads, yet they have small budgets to be able to uh, um, work on and optimize their e-commerce systems for security and efficiency. Um, so this kind of keeps them in a state of, of operating reactively rather than uh, proactively in, in, in terms of addressing some of their, their problems. Um, and, and, and also another issue is that from an attacker's perspective, it's much, much easier to launch an attack and, and learn about how, how to launch an attack and, and find tools, automated tools, that allow them to, to launch these attacks very easily. So the, the number of attackers and the attack vectors is rising significantly faster than our ability to protect those systems. Section 9.2 talks about basic e-commerce security issues in the landscape. It starts out by talking about some of the basic terminology or security terminology. Familiarizing yourself with some of this jargon is really pretty useful so that when you hear the terms, when you use the terms, that you, you know what you're using in the right context, that you, when you hear it, you understand the context in which it's being used. Uh, most of the terms are probably somewhat familiar with you, but I want you to develop that familiarity with these terms. So, we'll start out with the business continuity plan, a plan that keeps the business running after a disaster occurs. Each function in the business should have a valid recovery capability plan. The idea behind the, the business continuity plan is that once an incident occurs, that the organization needs to be able to continue to function even if, even if at only at a minimal level. And that's what the business continuity plan is. It's about uh, determining what the very bare most minimum uh, uh, functions are necessary 
and finding ways for those to continue to run even when significant disruptions occur. Cybercrime is the intentional, are intentional crimes carried out on the internet. Cybercriminal is a person who intentionally carries out crimes over the internet. Uh, so that's the person that's creating or, or conducting the cybercrime. Exposure refers to the estimated cost, loss, or damage that can result if a threat exploits a vulnerability. So it's really, how vulnerable are you? Fraud is any business activity that uses deceitful practices or devices to deprive another property or other rights. Malware, malicious software, is a generic term for malicious software, so it includes a variety of different types of malicious software. Viruses, um, adware, uh, can be adware, uh, spyware certainly uh, is an example, worms, those are all examples of malware. Phishing is a cybercrime technique to steal the identity of a target company to get the identities of its customers. Um, a lot of times you'll see phishing email, for example, where you'll get an email saying that we're from the bank, we need you to log in and, and uh, correct some information. And then they'll direct you to what seems like the legitimate website, but in, in reality oftentimes is, uh, is a website that's created by them. Um, there's other phishing techniques as well, but that's a, a fairly common one. And they basically get you to provide personal information or sensitive information to them. And, and it's often done uh, to be able to steal one's identity. Risk is the probability that a vulnerability will be known and used. Risk is kind of an interesting uh, concept when, as it relates to security because the reality is when we, when we talk security, when we think about security, um, oftentimes people tend to think that we simply eliminate risk. Um, we eliminate a threat and therefore there's zero risk. But the reality is, is we never truly eliminate all the risk that we take, all the, the, the potential uh, um, bad things that can happen to us. What we really do is we manage risk. We reduce our vulnerabilities down to a point where the risk is is to an acceptable level. So risk is a relatively easy concept, but it's more nuanced than what most people give it credit for. Social engineering is a type of non-technical attack that uses some ruse to trick users into revealing information uh, or performing an action that compromises a computer network. Um, probably a great example of this is a, a guy by the name of Kevin Mitnick um, who is probably has some very solid technical skills but where he absolutely excels is in the art of social engineering. He's written several books on it, uh, he's gotten himself in trouble with the law a few times, uh, spent some time in jail, but at this point he actually um, um, conducts penetration tests for organizations legitimately doing the, the same stuff he's always done uh, but now he gets paid to do it. And it's very interesting. He's written some very interesting books on the on the subject uh, so I'd recommend recommend looking him up if you get a, get the opportunity. Um, but it's really kind of a modern day con man if, if you're familiar with an, uh, that old term. Uh, it's just really been applied to uh, the uh, computer, uh, computer realm and it's referred to as social engineering. Spam is the electronic equivalent of junk mail, so those voluminous messages that we get that really don't seem related to anything. Uh, and the reality is, is it's effective. If, even if they get half a percentage point of, uh, of people responding to the relative to the millions of emails that they actually send, it's still a pretty good payoff because it's cheap to send those emails. A vulnerability is a weakness in software or other mechanism that threatens the confidentiality, integrity, availability of an asset. It's the, referred to as the CIA model. It can be directly used by, an, by a hacker to gain access to a system or a network. So it's a weakness. It, 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 it's a, uh, something that we um, don't, aren't real good at protecting ourselves uh, with. Um, a lot of times this is because of an unpatched system. In fact, most systems tend to be compromised, uh, that tend to be compromised due to some sort of vulnerability are oft oftentimes simply lacking that, uh, a patch that would actually correct for that vulnerability. So this is why it's really important to keep your systems patched, to keep your antivirus software uh, up to date, um, is to avoid th those types of issues. Zombies are computers infected with malware that are under the control of a spammer, hacker, or other criminal. A lot of times these become tools to be able to launch attacks against other computers. 
Um, so even though you yourself may not actually be a target, um, in some cases you're a target in the sense that they want to use your system against somebody else's system. Um, so again, it's important to keep your system patched. There's a lot of other terms that are out there, um, and, and you'll if this is an, inter an area that interests you, um, certainly you'll run across a lot of other terms. But these are probably some of the, the, the basic terms that you'll tend to run across. So if you think of e-commerce as a, a, a battleground, you can really kind of think about the landscape in terms of attackers, defenders, and, and the security requirements that that are necessary. So when you think about attacks, you think about the attackers and the methods that they might employ. So um, intentional attacks, criminals, unintentional uh, attacks, if you want to classify them in that way in terms of natural disasters, malfunctions, human errors, misconfigurations, for example. Targets include computers and, and information systems and people themselves. So hardware, software, procedures, email, and as I said, the people themselves, oftentimes people want to cooperate. They want to be helpful uh, to those around them. And oftentimes social engineers are able to capitalize on that. And can oftentimes people can, can uh, obtain sensitive information from, directly from individuals. And then we can think about the defenses, uh, the defenders and the methods that are, that are used. So we can think about software, hardware, prevention, detection, deterrence, uh, and so on. You can also think about regulations, policies, strategies, compliance, privacy, um, and, and a variety of other methods that we, we actually use to protect our, our, our systems. And we have to do this in the context of the legal system as well. Um, so defense is, a, is it can be particularly complicated depending on the domain that we're operating in. Information systems and e-commerce systems for that matter are all vulnerable to a variety of different tax and, and, and sources of tax, whether they be unintentional or intentional uh, uh, threats, attacks, crimes, etc. As far as unintentional threats, they can come from a variety of different places. They can come from human error, for example. A user may uh, uh, type in incorrect information into a database, uh, really rendering the value of that, that database uh, um, as less than, than what it would be with, if it had valid information. They may misconfigure a switch or a router or something like that, um, which opens up vulnerabilities. There are environmental hazards, things like natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and so on, uh, that, that, that can damage systems. There are malfunctions in, in computer systems themselves. Uh, sometimes power surges, for example, uh, will, will cause issues with uh, with computer equipment, uh, the age of equipment, defective equipment, uh, outdated equipment, poorly maintained, all of that can open an organization up to, to uh, um, being susceptible to certain threats that exist. As far as the uh, as some intentional attacks or, or crimes, um, those can occur in, in which cases theft of data may occur, uh, perhaps intellectual property that's stolen or or customer information detailing things like credit card uh, information, personal information, things like that. Inappropriate use of data, uh, like manipulating inputs. The theft of hardware, laptops, and, and other types of equipment. So those are, kind of fall within the purview of, of intentional attacks and, and, and crimes. As far as some of the techniques the criminals and, and, uh, use and the methods that they use, regardless of whether or not you're a hacker or a cracker, sometimes those techniques happen to be the same. It's not always the case, but in some cases uh, it is. For example, social engineering is something that both might be likely to use. Um, at the same time, there are probably some techniques that crackers are willing to use that this real kind of a code uh, of, of ethics, if you will, that hackers probably are a little bit less likely to, to violate, if you will. So keep in mind that, that a lot of the methods are probably very similar between these two camps, but at the same time there's probably some differences as well. And just for those who aren't clear, uh, a hacker has really kind of been a term that's been mm, tweaked over the years or, or twisted over the years. Um, it's not always been a malicious term. It's actually uh, traditionally uh, referred to simply uh, to one that was simply really interested in technology and understanding how it worked and, and they were literally hacking into a system to really discover how it worked. 
and generally their intentions were not to do harm. It was not to tear up the system or cause damage, but rather just to learn how it worked. Contrary to that was the cracker, and that was a person who was intentionally trying to do harm, intentionally trying to damage something, um, steal something, do something like that. So you kind of keep that, that, that in mind. Hollywood is really kind of twisted as such that hacker has kind of been a generic term um, that's really uses that, that latter definition uh, in, in its strictest sense that's not really what it means. Regarding the targets of the attacks in vulnerable areas you have to recognize that vulnerabilities create risk and so any, whenever you have these vulnerabilities you, you have to recognize that you're going to have this risk. If the re risk is above your degree of comfort if you will then you have to employ various methods to reduce that risk or eliminate or reduce those vulnerabilities. Um, as far as those vulnerabilities within an organization, we can kind of broadly break these up into a couple of different categories of, of technical versus organizational weaknesses. Technical weaknesses include things like un unencrypted communications, uh, insufficiently patched operating systems, insufficient use of antivirus and firewalls, weak boundary security, and poor application security. Organizational weaknesses include things like in lack of end user training and security awareness training. This one's a particularly interesting one because it, it's a relatively simple one to do. It's cheap, it's, it, it, it's easy to do, um, and tends to have very good results in, a, in, in the short run. Um, yet it's one that's often overlooked. It doesn't tend to get used nearly as often as it should. Other organizational weaknesses include uh, um, lack of security with mobile devices, and inappropriate use of business computers and network services. As far as security scenarios and requirements in e-commerce and, and the content of information security, we have to realize that information, uh, or excuse me, uh, e-commerce security involves more than just preventing and, and responding to cyber attacks and, and intrusions. And the book goes through a few different, um, when it goes through a scenario of a, of a user that tries to enter a website in order to obtain and possibly purchase some information, and it looks at it from, a, from, from three different perspectives. The user's perspective, the company's perspectives, or perspective, and from both parties' perspective. So if you think about it from the user's perspective, how can the user know whether the web server is owned and operated by a legitimate company? How do you know that's really who you're dealing with? How does the user know that the web page and, and forms have not been compromised by spyware and other malicious code? Uh, not that long ago, and when I say not that long ago, within the last few months, uh, the in, in Granbury, Texas, the, the local drive-in movie theater, the Brazos, um, their website had been cat uh, uh, classified by Google as containing malware. Um, so just because you visit a legitimate site doesn't mean that that site has not been compromised. How does the user know that, that a dishonest employee won't interrupt and misuse the information? Think about giving your credit card to a, a, a waiter or waitress at a, at, a, a, uh, at a restaurant. They take that card off and you really don't see what they do with it. You don't see whether or not they're skimming any of the information, the, the credit card number, your name, the security code that's on the back. You really don't know that, so dishonest employees are certainly a concern from the user's perspective. From the company's perspective, how do they know you as a user won't, won't try to, to compromise their web server? How do they know that the user won't try to, to disrupt the server so that it won't be available to other users? And from both users' perspectives, both parties' perspectives, how do both parties know that the network connection is free from eavesdropping by a third party? It might be listening in on the transaction. How do they know that the information sent back and forth between the server and the user's browser is, hasn't been altered? So these are some of the security concerns that, that occur when transactions are being conducted. So with those various scenarios in mind, we can start to think about the most appropriate mix, if you will, of the various security tools that we have at our disposal. We can start to think about authentication, which if I were to argue, I would say is probably the most important uh, aspect of security. We need to know that a person really is who they say they are. If we don't, authorization, for example, doesn't really mean anything. Um, so authentication is a process to verify or assure the real identity of an individual computer, computer program, or e-commerce website. So we really know that who we're talking to really is who they say they are. Authorization is the process of determining what the authenticated entity is allowed to access and what 
uh, operations it is allowed to perform. So once we identify or, or correctly identify the user through authentication, now we can start to figure out what they're authorized to do. They're authorized to print. They're authorized to open a certain file but not delete it. They're authorized to open a file and modify it but not delete it, and so on. Auditing uh, is another very important uh, tool that we have at our disposal that allows us to kind of keep track of what's going on. Who did what, when, where, and, and, and to what. Uh, so it gives us kind of a trail, if you will, of the, the activities that are occurring on a computer and on our network. Availability refers to keeping a system up and running. Uh, Non-repudiation is a very important concept as it relates to e-commerce. It's the assurance that online customers or trading partners cannot falsely deny or repudiate their purchase or transaction. So it's the idea that once you commit to make a purchase, that you're really committed to make that purchase and that you can prove programmatically um, that you are the one that actually authorized the purchase and that you're moving forward with the purchase and that you can't back out at a later date, a later date uh, and say that no, that, that I did not authorize that purchase. Ideally, security would be everybody's business in, in an organization, but the reality is, is that security needs and security uh, uh, applications oftentimes fall upon the the IS department or, uh, and security vendors to provide those services in, in terms of the technical side of things and they rely on management to provide administrative, uh, the administrative aspects such as policies and procedures and things like that. Um, together both of these groups work uh, in tandem to develop some sort of an e-commerce strategy, a strategy, a strategy that use e-commerce security as the process of preventing and detecting unauthorized use of the organization's brand, identity, website, email information, or other asset, and attempts to defraud the organization, uh, its customers, and employees. So to get together, these, these two camps work together to implement some sort of an e-commerce strategy in an effort to really kind of have a, a, method, a methodical approach to addressing the organization's security needs. And the idea behind providing a methodical approach is that hopefully you don't miss things, you don't leave any gaps in your security posture or your security plan. Now these next several bullets on this slide and the next uh, slide really borrow some concepts from the field of criminology, uh, specifically deterrence theory um, and a, a, a what's referred to as the security action cycle put forth by a, a professor out of the University of Georgia named Detmar Straub. Um, and general deterrence theory consists of four dimensions. They, they talk about three here. Um, the fourth one doesn't really translate particularly well into e-commerce. Um, it, it does transfer, it just not as well as, the, as these three. But deterring, detecting, and preventing are, are intuitive ones that really make a lot of sense and transfer quite well. Deterring measures, actions that will make criminals abandon their idea of attacking a specific system. The possibility of, uh, of losing their job for an insider. So basically you have policies in place. You um, make sure that everybody's aware of the ramifications of their actions. So we, that's why we have policies in place when you log in that tell users what will happen if they, they use our systems inappropriately. We put up warning signs. We, we do various things to deter users from using our systems inappropriately. The next dimension is prevention measures ways to help stop unauthorized users, also known as intruders, from accessing any part of the e-commerce system. So these are actual preventive measures. So in the real world, we might think of a locked door. Um, we might think of a fence with barbed wire across the top. In the security realm, computer security realm, we, we may think of passwords, biometrics, uh, things like uh, um, encryption, things like that. The last dimension we're going to look at here is, is detection measures, ways to determine whether intruders attempted to break into e-commerce systems, whether they were successful, and what they may have done. So think of our audit, our audit logs, which tell us who logged in, when they logged in, from what terminal they logged in, what files they accessed, when they accessed those files, and what they did with those files. So those are what provide us the ability to determine on what happened and create an audit trail, if you will, to be able to trace back what happened, when, where, and, and, and how. 
This leads us to information assurance, the, the protection of information systems against unauthorized access to or modification of information, whether in storage, so data at rest, processing, or in transit, data in motion, and against the denial of service to authorized users, including those measures necessary to detect, document, and counter such threats. That's really the ultimate goal of e-commerce security is to be able to provide information assurance. Exhibit 9.3 leads off section 9.3, which talks about technical attack methods from viruses to denial of service. And the exhibit lists in order, in descending order of importance, major technical security attack methods. And it starts off or leads off with malware, so viruses, worms, and trojans. And the reality is, uh, a lot of research suggests we really have a pretty good handle on malware in terms of our antivirus solutions. But this is something that's changing significantly because our reliance on portable devices, our smartphones, tablets, things like that, are creating a lot more attack vectors for uh, uh, malware writers. Uh, and, and this is certainly creating a problem for organizations. The next one is unauthorized access. Keep in mind that said unauthorized access, not unauthenticated access. So in a lot of cases, unauthorized access are internal users that are simply accessing resources that they shouldn't have access to, that they're not authorized to view. This is followed by denial of service, spam, hijacking, and, and, and botnets. I mentioned earlier some of the differences between... So how does a computer virus spread? Well, the term computer virus comes to us from the, the, the field of biology. Um, because it does uh, transfer from host to host in a very similar way as you might see um, in, in biology. First, a virus starts when a programmer writes the program itself, the, the virus, and embeds it in some sort of a host program. The virus attaches itself and travels anywhere that the host program or place of data travels, whether on CD, local area network, or bulletin boards. This didn't used to be a big deal before the days of, of uh, widespread days of networks because oftentimes you had to infect a disk and the disk had to travel from machine to machine, which was usually a very slow process. So viruses didn't traditionally spread particularly fast. The virus itself is set off either at, at, by, uh, uh, by at, at some sort of time limit or some other circumstance, such as a, a simple sequence of computer operations. Maybe you're clicking a particular key a combination or you open an attachment. Then it does whatever the programmer it has intended for it to do, referred to oftentimes as its payload, uh, which may be simply to type certain characters on the screen, to delete your hard drive, or obviously many things in between. A few very specific viruses are referred to as, as a microvirus, a Trojan horse, and then a very specific example of a Trojan horse, a banking Trojan, are all, like I said, very specific examples of types of, of, of uh, viruses. A macrovirus is, or a macro worm is, a, is executed when the application object that contains the macro is open for a particular procedure uh, is executed. Um, this is obviously very common to Microsoft products, specifically Microsoft Office products. In a lot of cases, macros are used to do, create certain functionality within the applications. But you also run the risk when this occurs to introduce a virus into your system. A Trojan horse is a program that appears to have a useful function, uh, but that contains a hidden function that present, presents a security risk. And this is to, you know, an, pays homage to Greek mythology uh, and the Trojan horse that had the, the soldiers inside. Um, and the idea is, is that you have a valid program that you get to use. Oftentimes it's a free program that you download and provides some sort of function. Sometimes it's a game uh, or perhaps gives you information about the weather or shopping, something like that. So it appears to have a legitimate purpose, but oftentimes in the background there's another program that's attached to it that's capturing your keystrokes or something like that. Uh, and, and that's the, the catch to it. That's what creates the security risk. A banking Trojan is a specific, specific example of a, of a, of a Trojan horse. A Trojan that comes to life when computer owners visit one of a number of online banking or e-commerce sites and again performs a very similar function, captures your keystrokes, captures um, any kind of transactional data, things like that. 
denial of service attack is an attack on a website in which an attacker uses specialized software to send a flood of data packets to the target computer with the aim of overloading its resources. Think of it kind of as, as being in line um, at say the bank and it seems like you, you, know, you, you go to the bank, you get in line and the patron that's up at the front of the line keeps talking to the, the teller and just when you think they're about done they start talking to the teller some more they bring up another topic another topic another topic they never finish their their topic they keep talking to the, the teller you're being denied service you're being denied access to the bank to the teller this the service that you need and this is conceptually what a denial of service attack is um, distributed denial of service is the same concept it's just rather than having a single attacker attacking a target you've got multiple attackers attacking a target Page stacking is related to one of the concepts we talked about earlier, the weakness, or one of the weaknesses of the internet in terms of DNS and IP addressing and, and, and somebody changing that mapping between those two, those two addresses. Um, and basically what, what can happen is you can redirect a user from the legitimate IP address to a fake IP address or to a different IP address to a page that looks very similar if not almost identical to the page you're trying to get to. So creating a rogue copy of a popular website that shows contents similar to the original to a web crawler once there an unsuspecting user is redirected to malicious websites. So it may contain all this content. Think about it, they're, they're criminals in many cases. They don't care about stealing the, the logos of companies. Um, they don't think twice about any of, any of those types of legal issues, uh, copyright issues they're trying to capture your information so they're going to make try to make it as authentic looking as they possibly can to get you to share information that you might not otherwise share before jumping into a botnet um, first you kinda of need to know what a bot is a bot is a captured computer it's a computer that uh, a cracker remotely is captured and has control over in some respect in some way they've got control over that that bot or over that computer and that computer has been referred to as a bot isn't it being robotically controlled, it's a, it's a bot. Um, a botnet is a collection of those computers, a huge number, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands potentially, of hijacked internet computers that have been set up to forward traffic, including spam, viruses, to other computers on the internet. By controlling this botnet, it gives whoever the controller is an awful lot of control. They can launch these di distributed denial of service attacks. They can uh, um, remotely um, send spam and forward traffic and viruses very quickly all around the globe. So botnets become a very very powerful tool in the arsenal of, of crackers. Malvertising is a, a basically fast, uh, false online advertising designed to trick you into downloading malicious software onto your computer. Usually what will happen is you'll get some kind of a fake message on, on the screen saying that your computer's been been infected with a virus or has some sort of security vulnerability and this is the most popular type of, uh, of malvertising and they're trying to encourage you to download some fake security software to be able to correct the issue and it's really infected software that's, that's designed to again capture personal information of some type or another. Social engineering is another potential threat and the, perhaps the scary thing about social engineering is one need not have a, a particularly uh, um, strong skill set technically. In fact, they really don't have to have any, uh, virtually any skill set technically. Um, the process basically works by applying a variety of different phishing methods in order to be able to target victims and obtain personal information from them. This may be simply through phone calls, for example, getting victims to share information with you that oftentimes might not seem uh, uh, particularly important at the time but it turns out to be very important later. Once they obtain this information they can either use that information to commit financial crime or, or, or cro uh, fraud uh, themselves or they can sell it uh, in, in, uh, to a, the, the underground um, in some type of knee market underground and uh, in exchange for cash or some, something else to other criminals who they themselves then commit some sort of financial fraud or crime. Sophisticated phishing methods are often used on the internet to obtain personal information which usually lead to um, various types of fraud being committed. 
this is the type of thing that's going to be pretty common in any type of environment where buyers and sellers really can't see each other. It really breeds that 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 possibility for for fraud to occur. Um, as far as some of the specific examples of fraud on the internet, um, the book talks about on page 472 a couple of different examples. Uh, Hawaiian Airlines specifically and Google Apps. Uh, as a couple of uh, specific examples. In general, things like literary scams, poetry scams, jury duty scams, chain letters and email scams, lottery scams, Nigerian scams, work at home scams. There's way too many scams to be more, far more than you could possibly, possibly list. But those are all examples of different types of scams that can be run. <clears throat> the idea behind this is that if you can use this the information that you gather in these phishing attempts you can start to build an online profile you can start to build an identity for a person um, and use that identity to commit further fraud identity theft refers to stealing an identity of a person and, and that information is then used by someone pretending to be someone else in order to steal money or get some other sort of benefit Exhibit 9.6 illustrates how, uh, one, shows one example of how phishing might occur in, in a specific, very specific situation. First step is that a hacker tries to uh, attack a website in order to be able to redirect users to another server. Once the, 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 a legitimate user tries to, to reach the legitimate server, they're redirected to this bad website. This bad website then sends, sends data or malware back to the user, at which point that that uh, software is installed without the user knowing. Once that's completed, that software tends to run in the background and sends private information back to the hacker. Virtually every online organization is subject to various cyber crimes that, that are out there. And though you might think that uh, banks, for example, financial institutions might have more stringent security, they're, as, they're susceptible as well. A variety of different types of, of online financial fraud exist. Um, other financial forms of financial fraud, things like the sale of bogus inventory uh, investments, phantom business opportunities, and get rich quick schemes, to name a few. As far as spam and spyware attacks, over 90% of the messages on corporate networks in April of 2010 were, spam, were email spam. It's estimated that worldwide, a total of 62 trillion trillion with a T spam emails were sent in 2008 globally annual annual spam energy use totals 33 billion with a B kilowatt hours that's equivalent to running electricity used in 2.4 million homes in the United States with the same gigahertz uh, emissions as 3.1 million passenger cars using 2 billion gas uh, gallons of gasoline Spam has frustrating and, and confused and, and annoyed email users for years. Um, approximately 80% of all spam is sent by fewer than 200 spammers. It's a relatively small number of, of individuals that are generating the vast majority of spam email. Since the cost of spam is borne mostly by the recipient, spam is really a pretty effective email advertising form. Email addresses are collected or harvested in a variety of different ways, including collecting them from chat rooms, websites, news groups, and viruses that harvest users' address books. So keep in mind, whenever you're, you're sending information out there, you're signing up for something, when it includes your email address, a lot of times that email address can be harvested in some way, shape, or form. As far as spyware, spyware is a computer software that is installed surreptitiously on a personal computer to intercept or take control or partial control over the user's interaction with the computer without the user's knowledge or consent. Some of the functions of spyware extend well beyond simple monitoring of what's going on. They can collect information as well. So that's something to keep in mind. They can also interfere with your control, use computer cycles, resulting in a slower computer. It can change your computer settings, change your home page, for example. And it can result in slow surfing uh, speeds and or loss of functionality. Social networking makes social engineering particularly easy. Traditionally, uh, using social engineering techniques really required cleverly worded emails and face-to-face -face conversations to be able to obtain personal information from users. 
Uh, sometimes this took a while in order to be able to develop trust between the social engineer and a potential victim. The social, social networking sites are creating a means for hackers and con artists to worm their way into the confidence of users, which leaves internet users and businesses at, at greater risk of attack, according to a study by Danish security group uh, CSIS. How hackers are attacking social networks? Keep in mind that social networks are designed to facilitate the sharing of personal information. That's what they do, and they do a good job of it. The more data that a person provides or discloses to the social networking site, the more valuable that that person is to the site, the more value they are to their friends. Unfortunately, social networking sites tend to have a pretty poor track record uh, in terms of security. Some of the examples that I talked about in the text on page 477, um, a lot of social networking sites allow for applications and to be installed on your on your social networking site. A lot of times those those applications are written by third parties and so that you run the risk of those third par parties not necessarily having the best intent uh, in mind. Another technique is to create fake profiles and use those fake profiles to post mal malicious links and fish, fish other users. And there's a variety of other ones that you can check out on that page as well. Spam and social networks in the, in the web 2.0 environment. Social networks attracted spammers due to the large number of potential recipients and the less secured internet platforms. So think about that. There's a lot more targets out there that you can access because social networks are very popular right now, and very large, and have a lot, a lot of, uh, of internet users. It's a less secured environment, so obviously you're going to attract spammers. As far as, as bloggers or uh, uh, other types of, of Web 2.0 env uh, environment issues, think about blogs. Blogs have found hundreds of automatically generated comments with links to, uh, to Herbal Viagra and gambling uh, vendors on their pages. Software bots that crawl the internet looking for suitable forms to fill in automatically generate the majority of the blog, of blog spam. Blog owners can use tools to ensure that humans and not automated uh, uh, systems inner comments on their blogs. I personally run into this uh, on an e-commerce site that I run uh, where products are offered for sale and there's a section for comments and, and periodically we'll get comments that have literally nothing to do with with the website, the product, or anything of that nature. They're completely unrelated and it's being filled in by, by uh, uh, individuals like this. Search engine spam is um, defined as pages creating, created deliberately to trick a search engine into offering inappropriate, redundant, or poor quality search results. Uh, those pages are called spam sites, use techniques that deliberately subvert a search engine's algorithms to artificially inflate the pages uh, rank, uh, rank or rankings depending on the number of pages. A similar tactic involves the use of SPLOGs, which is short for, for spam blog sites, which are blogs created solely for marketing purposes. Spammers create hundreds of SPLOGs that they link to the spammer site to increase that site's search engine ranking. Basically the idea is, is that a site uh, is generated in order to be able to attract users, um, even if they're not there for the intended purpose but then they're bombarded with various advertisements in the hopes that they'll click on one of the one or more of the various links and that's how they generate their revenue is, is from those clicks. A data breach is, is a security incident in which sensitive, protected, or confidential data is copied, transmitted, viewed, stolen, or used by an individual unauthorized to, to do so. Uh, the, the types of incidents range from, from a concerted attack by cyber criminals with the, the backing of national governments to careless disposal of, of used computer equipment or data storage media. Types of information that can be obtained or retrieved, financial information, personal health information, personally identifiable information, trade secrets of a corporation, or intellectual property. Between a period of January, between the period of January 2005 and May of 2008, it's estimated that over 227 individual or 227 million individual records containing sensitive personal information were involved in security security breaches in the United States. So it kind of gives you an idea and an appreciation 
for the massive uh, amount of data breach uh, incidents that are occurring just here in the United States alone. Section 9.5, the Information Assurance Model and Defense Strategy, starts to introduce to you a framework uh, with which you can use to kind of think about security mechanisms uh, as a way of protecting your data, protecting your information. And they start with what's known as the CIA Security Triad, or the CIA Triad. Three security concepts important to, to information on the internet, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is the assurance of data privacy and accuracy, keeping private or sensitive information from being disclosed to unauthorized individuals, entities, or processes. In other words, your data is seen by those who need to see it and not seen by those who don't need to see it. Confidential. The I in the CIA triad stands for integrity. And this is the assurance that stored data has not been modified without authorization. A message that was sent in the, is the same message as that which was received. In, in that last sentence, or that last part of the sentence, really kind of sums it up. Whatever data we send is the data that's actually received on the other end, without being modified at all. If it is modified, we know about it. If it's modified, it, that message is said to lack integrity. So we want to make sure that me messages have integrity so that we know that a message has not been modified from where, when it was sent to where it was received. The A in the CIA tri triad stands for availability, assurance that access to data, the website, or other e-commerce data service is timely, available, reliable, and restricted to authorized users. Remember the conversation we had earlier when we talked about denial of service attacks. This is the response to that. This says we want to make sure we do have access to that ATM that we do have access to that website, to that service, whatever it happens to be. That's what av availability is all about. An e-commerce security strategy needs to address the information assurance model and its components. You, we'll take a look at uh, Exhibit 9.7 here in just a moment, but we need to start to think about s that, that security strategy. The first, is, is that we, the first thing we want to look at is the objective of, of security defense. So we want to start to think about uh, uh, prevention and deterrence. Ideally, we prevent something and deter people from trying to, to breach our site in the first place. If that doesn't work, we want detection. We want to be able to, to know when our system has been breached, who did it, when they did it, how much damage has occurred. We want to be able to, to contain the damage. In other words, limit the, the amount of damage that, that someone can do to our site. We want the ability to recover. Uh, so, in, in other words, to be able to repair the damage. We need to be able to correct the damage, in other words, get back to the way we were before the damage occurred. And then we also need awareness and compliance, which is really more of a continual process of constantly reminding users and, and members about what proper policies and procedures are and how to avoid some of the hazards that exist. As far as uh, security spending versus the needs gap, it's really a major concern in information security management because it's hard to match the, the money, labor, and time against the various security threats that exist, largely because the threat landscape is constantly changing. New techniques and new software new tools are constantly evolving, which means the threats are constantly evolving. So it's hard to align the spending with the dangerous threats in that environment. Therefore, we need some sort of a defense strategy in which we can explore the, uh, the next seven items. We need to be able to determine, for example, what are the greatest data, current data security issues? And again, this is something that's constantly evolving. We, need to, we can't simply answer these questions and revisit them, or, or answer these questions and be done with them. We need to periodically revisit the, these questions and the answers to them. Another one is, what is the greatest risk of exposure? Where do you spend the money and how much spending is matched with rich risk exposure. What are the benefits, including intangible, which are tough to measure, that you can get from money spent on security project tools? What are the losses due to security incidents in your organization and in general? What are the top security technologies that reduce security losses, for example, firewalls, antivirus, and, and things like that? And lastly, what will be the guidelines for the upcoming security budget? Lastly, assessing security needs. Um, there's a couple of different ways of trying to find out 
what the current strategies and solutions should be. And this is done through a risk assessment process. The first way is through a vulnerability assessment, which is the process of identifying, quantifying, and prioritizing the vulnerabilities in a system. In e-commerce, we want to concentrate largely on our networks, database, and fraud protection. Another method is by conducting a penetration test, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. Back to the concept of a pen test or penetration test. It's a method of evaluating the security of a computer system or networks by simulating an attack from a malicious source, for example, a cracker. Um, so it's a, it's a way to test the system to make sure that you're resilient to some degree, more or less, to various uh, vulnerabilities that exist. As far as, as uh, e-security programs, which are, are defined as all the policies, procedures, documents, and standards, uh, standards, hardware, software, training, and personnel that work together to protect information, the ability to conduct business and other assets. Keep in mind that they have a life cycle through which that, uh, um, throughout that life cycle, e-commerce security requirements must be continuously evaluated and adjusted. That life cycle management of uh, an information system security involves maintaining this, the security posture of an information system throughout its life, throughout its, its life cycle, really from the conception of, of the system to design, to implementation, to release, to retirement through, it, the, in, through the integration of information. As far as computer security incident management, this is really the, involves the day-to-day -day operations, the monitoring and detection of security events on a computer or computer network, and the execution of proper responses to those events. The goal is to be able to create well understood events and uh, produce predictable responses to damaging events and computer intrusions in order to make sure that you're responding appropriately, responding properly, and that way you can drill and, and make sure that you're, you're responding in a quick and, and timely manner. And graphically, exhibit 9.8 illustrates the e-commerce security lifecycle management process. Uh, it, this is one representation. It, it could actually take on a number of different forms, but you see response uh, in, uh, or actually executing the incident response plan, uh, moving on to training, requirements, design, implementation, verification, release, and you either start back over or you retire that plan and you move on to an, a new plan. In order to be able to apply all of this in, in, within the context of everything we've discussed so far, um, we can look at, it, at this general framework uh, that's, that's presented here, uh, starting off with defending access to computing systems, data flows, and e-commerce transactions. How do we go about doing that? Well, we have to start to, to account for and think about access control, encryption of content, and public key infrastructure. With respect to the second item, defending e-commerce networks, this is where firewalls start to step in in order to be able to protect our systems. Intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems are, are a good fit here as well. As far as general administrative and application controls, now we're start to, starting to think about establishing guidelines and checklist procedures. For number four, protection against social engineering and fraud. This is where we, we start to describe protection against spam, phishing, and spyware. It's largely going to be based on training, uh, training our various users throughout an organization on how to spot these, these types of, of, uh, of issues. For number five, disaster preparation, business continuity, and risk management. These are usually managerial issues that are supported by, by uh, specific software pieces. And lastly, implementing enterprise-wide security programs. This is where we kind of bring it all together and we coordinate the activities of the pre five previous uh, points in a cohesive manner and to make sure that we're not missing anything. Section 9.6, Access, Control, Encryption, and Public Key Infrastructure, picks up that uh, on, in detail on that very first point that we just finished with. 
Um, access control is the mechanism that determines who can legitimately use a network resource. And this is done through some form of authentication. Authentication is that we're going to verify a user is who they really, really is who they claim to be. And it's usually tightly integrated with authorization. Once we've identified that they really are who they say they are, now we know what, what resources to grant them access to and which ones to deny them access from. There's generally several different ways we can go about authenticating a user. And it's generally tied around either something that we know, such as a password, something that we have, like some kind of a token. Uh, think of our ATM card as an example. We, we use our ATM card and a PIN. We combine those two and we have a, a, a token. Your PIN does you no good without the ATM card. Um, and then lastly, what we are, perhaps the be best choice of the three, mostly because we can't lose it. There's no need to reset it. We, we don't have to reset our thumbprint. Uh, and, and that's an example of a biometric control. So biometric control is an automated method for verifying the identity of a person based on physical or behavioral characteristics. Biometric systems are authentication systems that identify a person by measurement of a biological characteristic, such as fingerprints, iris patterns, facial features, voice, etc. Um, they're not fail-safe, biometric systems are not. Um, having said that, they, they hold a lot of promise, and so there's kind of this shift towards them. Having said that, by, by a long shot, passwords are, are what you know is still the most common form of authentication. Uh, and, and it's used largely because people know or people are familiar with it. It's cheap to implement. Most systems have passwords built into them already. Um, and it, it's something that users are familiar with. So it still tends to be the most widely used form of authentication. But there is this push to go more towards biometrics and, and uh, through token-based um, authentication techniques. Encryption comes in a couple of different general flavors, public key and private key encryption. And it's what we use to protect some of our communications, specifically as we're, we're sending sensitive information, such as credit card numbers or, or things like that across the internet. We need some way of protecting that as it goes out into the public sphere, which is the internet. And we do that using encryption. Encryption is the process of scrambling or encrypting a message in such a way that it's difficult, expensive, and or time consuming for an unauthorized person to unscramble or decrypt it. There's a couple of term, uh, terms that you need to kind of be familiar with when you start to talk about encryption. There's plain text, which is the unencrypted message in human readable form. It's the original message. It's nothing's been done to alter it. Ciphertext is plain text message after it's been encrypted into a machine readable form. So now you no longer really understand what what the meaning is behind that behind that original text. It's been encrypted. The encryption algorithm is a mathematical formula used to encrypt the plain text into ciphertext and vice versa. And essentially it's a it's a math formula of some sort. And it's the key and I don't want to say key because I don't want to confuse you but it's the method with, with which you use to, to encrypt something. So in other words, you may sh use a shift cipher of some kind, and you may shift you know, the three letters over, or four letters over, or five letters over. The algorithm is that you shift to the right X number of keys, or X number of, of letters. The key is the number. So if it's a shift cipher and, and we're shifting three, three spaces to the right, the key is three. All we need to know is, is two things, the encryption algorithm, the shift, and the key, three. Those two tell us how to decrypt and in, how to encrypt and decrypt the message. Key space is the large number of possible key values or keys created by an algorithm to use when transforming the message. The larger the key space, the, more, the safer the encryption uh, algorithm or technique is going to be, the harder it is to guess. If you only have two possibilities for a key space, it's obviously very easy. So the more space that you have, the more possibilities of key values that you have, the more difficult it is to break the, the, the encryption. Exhibit 9.10 shows, shows us a very uh, simple encryption uh, approach. It's referred to as symmetric or private key encryption. A couple things about symmetric or private key encryption. When you see symmetric, it starts with the letter S, think same. 
The reason that's important is what you're using to encrypt and decrypt the message is exactly the same. It's the same key. Something else to keep in mind about it, because it's the same key, you have to keep it private. Both parties have to keep it private. If the key is discovered by anybody else, the messages run the risk of no longer being private. And this creates a problem. You have to be able to share that key with whoever you're trying to send a message to. Well, if they're very close by, that's not a difficult process. If, however, they're very far away, we've got to figure out some way to get them a copy of the key in a safe way in which it's not copied. So we've got to provide it through an, what they refer to as an out-of-band transmission. In other words, we may mail it. We may fly over and personally hand it to somebody. But if it's an email message that we're trying to encrypt, by no means do you email it to the, to the user. Because if somebody intercepts the email, they've got the email and the key. Um, one advantage to symmetric key encryption, it's a very efficient approach. So there are advantages, but there's also disadvantages as well. Another disadvantage is, a disadvantage is key, the key management process. When there's two people that want to share a message, it's very simple and straightforward. It's just two keys, uh, one key and a copy uh, of that key. But if there's three people, the number of keys goes up especially if you want to have an individually private message with everybody. You've got to have a private key between you and this, the second uh, recipient and you and the third recipient. So now you've got to manage two keys and the process of getting those, those copies to number two and to number three. Now, if you've got four users, the problem gets even bigger. And so key management can become a, a big problem real, really quickly uh, using symmetric key encryption. There are a number of different uh, types of, of public key encryption, or standards, if you will, of public key encryption. One of the more popular ones is DES, Data Encryption Standard. Standard symmetric encryption algorithm supported by the NIST and used by U.S. government agencies until October of 2000. Um, the reality is, is that encryption algorithms um, really uh, have a finite lifetime as computers become faster, more powerful, uh, and that's just the reality of, of the encryption business. Um, having said that, their con uh, um, data encryption standards are always evolving. There's another more recent standard, Triple DES, for example, which is much more robust um, and is still used in, in, in a lot of cases. Alternative to um, private key, um, the use of private keys or symmetric key encryption, is the use of the public key infrastructure, which is a scheme for securing e-payments using public key encryption and various technical components. The parts that make up public key encryption include a public key, asymmetric key encryption, which is the public key, and a private key, it's a paired key set. So public or asymmetric key encryption is a method of encryption that uses a pair of matched keys, a public key to encrypt the message and a private key to decrypt it or vice versa. The public key is an encryption code that is public, publicly available to anyone. You may encrypt a message using your public key and that public key is available in, say, the body of your email, as a signature in your email, in some sort of a directory that people can look up. You want everybody to know what your public key is. The private key is an encryption code that is known only to its owner. You don't share it with anybody. It's not posted in any sort of directory or any other place for that matter. Public key infrastructure, or, or excuse me, public key uh, encryption, really is something that uh, uh, basically allows us to send uh, messages back and forth in a safe manner in a much more easy process than private key encryption. In other words, the key management process is simplified. Essentially, if we want to send an encrypted message to an individual, we look up their public key in the directory or in previous messages where we received it in their signature or wherever we happen to, to be able to find it. We encrypt the message with their public key and send it to that individual. Um, because of the unique relationship between the public key and the private key, the only key that will decrypt that message is the private key, which the, the, the uh, person who's receiving the message has. Anybody else that has access to the pri uh, public key is unable to decrypt that message. Now, this unique relationship between these two keys gives us the capability of doing something else. 
gives us the capability of creating a, what's known as a digital certificate or digital uh, signature. And this allows us to validate the sender and timestamp of a transaction so it cannot be later claimed that the transaction was not authorized or that it's invalid. This is what we were referring to earlier when we were talking about non-repudiation. It gives us the ability to say, no, this person really did make this purchase. Now, the digital signature is created by essentially generating a hash function or using a hash function which is a mathematical computation that is applied to a message using a private key to encrypt the message. This hash function takes the original message, runs this hash on it to generate a calculation, and this becomes our message digest, a summary of the message converted into a string of digits after the hash has been applied. We're able to, to compare this hash at a later date, and we're allowed to, this allows us to compare the two files, and if the two files match up, we know that the message is authentic. If the message digest does not match up, it's not authentic. Something has altered that message. So that process might look something like this. If the message uh, create, uh, the uh, uh, person creates some sort of a message, and the sender sends it to the message, uh, creates a message digest, and ends up generating a digital signature. So the message with that digital signature has a hash run, that run against it to create a digital envelope. It's then sent, that digital envelope sent to the, the recipient. The recipient then opens up that message. They compare that digital signature. The, receipt of the, uh, the receipt, uh, recipient decrypts using the recipient's private key, and they are able to look at the message. The recipient applies the hash function, and if it matches the original message digest, the two match, it's a legitimate message. If they don't match, it's not. Something's happened to it. And that digital envelope I just mentioned is the combination of the encrypted original message and the digital signature using the recipient's public key. Now in some cases the, the, the sender and the receiver don't know each other and if you're conducting some, some sort of a financial transaction, especially if it's a large one, one where you may not trust and neither party trusts each other, you may end up using what's known as a certificate authority, um, which is a third party that issues digital certificates. A digital certificate is basically a, a certificate that someone has identified this individual and is certifying that this person or this organization really is who they claim to be. Uh, and it's a way to add a little bit of additional security to uh, um, uh, individuals in these, the, that conduct these types of transactions. Related to all this, uh, particularly transactions across the internet, is the concept of SSL, Secure Socket Layer. Uh, SSL is just a method of encrypting messages across the internet that combines both public key and private key encryption uh, in order to be able to take advantage of the 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 uh, uh, take advantage of both of the advantages of each approach. In other words, we use the, uh, public key infrastructure to be able to exchange private keys, which operate more efficiently, and then we conduct the rest of the transactions using that private key. Um, it, it's definitely something that adds complexity to transactions that are occurring across the internet. Fortunately, a lot of that uh, um, infrastructure that, that's going on, a lot of those processes that are going on, um, are facilitated by our web browsers and, and web servers, uh, so that it happens in the background. In this case, most of the time, users don't have to have any familiarity with any of these types of, of things. They just want to be aware that they are actually occurring make sure that they know that their transactions are, are secure. Part two of the defense uh, securing e-commerce networks uh, is about firewalls to the, uh, for the most part. A firewall is a single point between two or more networks where all traffic must pass, so it's a choke point. It's the device that authenticates, controls, and logs all traffic. The reality is, is there's a variety of different types of firewalls, and the, and the term firewall itself originates really from literally a firewall that exists in, in multi-housing multi units um, that allows a, a fire to occur in one area and to help protect other areas um, to help prevent the flames from, from spreading too quickly and before users are able to get or, or um, um, occupants are able to get out. So a firewall is really designed to protect one network from another network and keep the bad guys, keep the fire out. A popular technique when it comes to firewalls is, is a packet firewall, which looks at, seg looks at the segments of data sent from one computer to another 
uh, on a network and analyzes them to make sure that, that they make sense, that they should be allowed onto the network. As far as the DMZ, it's a demilitarized zone and, and is reminiscent of the DMZ that exists between North and South Korea. Um, it, it's a simple firewall case uh, in which there's a firewall between the internet and the internal users, um, usually sitting on the, on the corporate internet. In the DMZ architecture, the DMZ stands for demilitarized zone, and there are two firewalls between the internet and the internal users. The area between the two firewalls is referred to as the DMZ, and it's a dedicated it um, it and it is dedicated as the one for business partners. The architecture is shown in Exhibit 9.12, which is on the next slide. As stated earlier, firewalls come in a lot of different uh, uh, flavors, if you will, uh, um, in terms of being host-based, those installed on your individual computer, and network-based firewalls, which are, are really designed to protect an entire network. A personal firewall is a network node designed to protect an individual user's desktop system from the public network by monitoring all the traffic that passes through the computer's network interface card. This is what typically you see built into Windows. Uh, in a lot of cases, there are third-party firewalls, uh, personal firewalls that, that may be installed with your, your antivirus suite or something of that nature. Zone Alarm is, a, is an example of a personal firewall. Um, additionally, there's, there's a variety of other defense mechanisms that you can use, such as antivirus, malware detection, and, and botnet protection. Another defense mechanism that, that you can use is a, what's known as a virtual private network, a VPN. And this is a network that uses the public internet to carry information but remains private by using encryption to scramble the communications uh, authentication to ensure that information has not been tampered with and access control to verify the identity of anyone using the network. So the idea is that we're going to use tunneling, what's referred to as protocol tunneling. Uh, to be able to use on the public internet, which is relatively inexpensive, and create a virtual environment that's virtually private. It appears private because everything, all the data is encrypted. So even though it's in a very public forum, we're encrypting that data. You might liken it to being in a room with nothing but English speakers, and being able, and you be you along with the person you're trying to communicate, being able to speak in another language. And because of that, your conversation is virtually private even though everybody else can hear it they don't understand what's actually occurring this is done through a process referred to as protocol tunneling method used to ensure confidentiality and integrity of data transmitted over the internet by encrypting data packets sending them in packets across the internet and decrypting them at the destination intrusion detection systems or IDS's are a special category of software that can monitor activity across the network or on a host computer watch for suspicious activity, and take automated action based on what it sees. So basically what happens is that it, in most cases it, it has definitions much like a, an antivirus um, application might, and it looks for patterns of intrusions to occur. When it monitors those uh, or observes those patterns occurring, it can usually do one of two things. It can either notify someone uh, who can take action, such as a network administrator, or it can actually go ahead and automate actions itself, such as shutting down a port, blocking a particular IP address, or something of that nature. And this is kind of related to dealing with denial of service attacks. Intrusion One of the keys to dealing with denial of service attacks is being able to detect such an attack uh, very early on in the stages of the attack. That's where intrusion detection systems come in. They help you to, to determine that more quickly than you might otherwise be able to, to notice. Additionally, some of the promise of cl cloud computing um, uh, is that 
it has been shown that, that cloud computing is relatively resistant to denial of service attacks. Uh, so it's, it's denial of service attacks, though they are still occurring, um, are not quite as effective as they once were. And kind of as a side note to intrusion detection system, are the it is the concept of a honey net and a honey pot. A honey net is a network of honey pots, and a honey pot is a production system. For example, it may be a system that, that acts as a firewall, or acts as a router, or a web server, or a database server, or an email server, or a combination of, of one or, or of two or more of these. Uh, that looks like it does real work, but in reality, it's a it's a decoy, and it's simply used as a study mechanism, as a a, a, a tool to monitor the, the techniques that hackers use or crackers use to try to infiltrate a system. Um, and it's useful for, useful for studying their patterns and trying to dis discover what it is they do and how they try to do it. Uh, it's kind of a gray area because you run into the risk of entrapping uh, individuals into, into doing illegal behavior. So the legality of, of the approaches is, is somewhat murky. Um, but back to the more general concept of, of security in the in, in the, these areas that regardless of your your firewalls and your 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 uh, intrusion detection systems and the information that you learn from the use of honey pots or honey nets uh, you still also have to to address email security um, email is traditionally not a particularly secure mechanism for sending and receiving messages that there are some things that you can do to to increase your security, such as encrypting your messages um, and, and running antivirus um, packages that test your email as you're sending messages and receiving messages to reduce the amount of, of malware that you might send or receive. The third step or third category of, of defending our, our e-commerce systems includes the use of general controls and, and uh, uh, application controls and things like that. Application controls, or excuse me, general controls are controls that are established to protect uh, the system regardless of the specific application. For example, protecting hardware and controlling access to the data center are independent of any sort of specific application. So these include things like the appropriate design of the data center, um, shielding cables against electromagnetic interference, fire pre prevention detection and extinguishing systems. It may include power shutoff and backup batteries. Properly design and maintain and, and operated air conditioning systems to help cool the data center. And then things like motion detection alarms and that detect physical intrusion. Those are all examples of general controls that really aren't specific to the software and the, the hardware that's being used. Application controls, however, are intended to protect specific applications. So this may be controls that are built into a specific application, say for a web server, for example, to help protect the, the software that, that's in or the, the various files that are located within a web server. Same thing for an email server, a file server, etc. Exhibit 9.13 kind of gives you a graphical representation of, the, of some of those different defense controls that you can can utilize again on the the general in the area of general defense controls you've got physical ac physical access data security communication administrative and other um, and, and you can use a variety of different tools to to help um, defend systems this way for example when we talk about access you can use biometrics you can use various web controls for authentication and encryption and things like that on the application side Maybe you're, you're monitoring input and maybe you're monitoring uh, processing or output. Those are various things that you can monitor to be able to help defend the applications that you're using. Traditionally, compliance or non-compliance or breach information was gathered manually. Uh, and obviously this was very time consuming and, and often res resulted in incomplete information. The use of intelligent agents, however, really provides a lot of promise. Not only does it allow you to uh, gather a lot of that inf information automatically, um, but it also allows you to be more complete and uh, to, in some cases, respond automatically to situations that, that occur. Intelligent agents are software applications that have some degree of reactivity, autonomy, and adaptability, as is needed in unpredictable attack situations. 
an agent is able to adapt itself based on changes occurring in, the, in its environment. So for example, an intrusion detection system uh, or an intrusion prevention system may have sensors placed throughout the network to be able to observe the data that's coming across the network. As it notices changes, it's then able to react as, it, as necessary in order to be able to protect the network. Those are examples of intelligent agents that the firewall is monitoring the, the information that it's getting back from those sensors and adjusting on the fly. Protecting yourself against spam is really more an art than a science, uh, though there are certainly there have certainly been attempts to to make it a little bit more scientific by assessing where emails are originating from, um, automatically examining the contents of subject uh, header subject information or the content of an email and directing it either into a, a spam or junk email folder or sending it to the email box. Those, those, have, those processes have been attempted and are utilized, but they're not fail-safe. They're not perfect. They're, they still require manual investigation periodically into your junk mail uh, folder just to identify the occasional false positive. Um, in the United States specifically, an approach has, has been taken to try to deal with the spam issue, uh, refer, which is referred to as the Can Spam Act, controlling the uh, assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing uh, act. It's a law that makes it a crime to send commercial email messages with false or misleading message headers or mis misleading subject lines. And while great in theory, a big part of the issue comes from the fact that email messages originate from around the globe and it's very difficult to enforce something like this. Having said that, the majority of spam actually originates from the United States. Uh, so that's, that's something to keep in mind when we're talking about this. But again, because other countries don't necessarily have those same laws, it's very difficult to enforce something like that overseas. As far as protecting yourself against pop-up ads, some of it really depends on where the ads are originating from. There's several solutions that exist, uh, one of which includes software that will block pop-up ads and prevent them from appearing. In some cases, ISPs offer tools that will, will stop pop-up pop-ups from occurring. Certain browsers offer that feature as well. But keep in mind, in some cases, it's not they're not the pop-up ads are not originating from the browser, rather they're originating from applications that are loaded on the on the computer and a lot of those tools that, that stop pop-up browsers tend to be less effective or ineffective completely against those types of pop-ups. As far as protecting yourself against social engineering attacks and specifically against phishing and, and malvertising, realize that there in many cases of some of these attacks there is no one specific way of protecting yourself against these. There's a variety of different ways that you can take depending on the needs of your specific organization. For example, Microsoft you know, to to fend off malvertising uh, recommends a variety of different uh, approaches in, such as installing a firewall and keeping it turned on, using automatic updating uh, to keep your operating system up to date, installing antivirus and anti-spyware software such as Microsoft Security Essentials and keeping it updated. Um, if your antivirus software does not include anti-spyware software, you should install a separate anti-spyware software, such as what, uh, Windows Defender, uh, uh, Spybot Search and Destroy, things like that. As far as protecting your, yourself against spyware, um, and, and specifically against uh, um, um, a lot of various types of, uh, of malware, not just, not specifically, but not sp uh, specifically spyware, but malware in general, um, using policies and trainings is, is extremely important. Things like training, acceptable use policies, um, reminding employees what they can and can't do, what they should and shouldn't do, in terms of sharing information, in terms of, of uh, downloading applications and files from, from the internet, from untrusted sites, and opening attachments. A lot of the basics uh, that, that are some of the central tenets of security really goes a long way to protecting your organizations. It's also one of the cheapest ways of protecting your systems. Um, so periodically remindingly, uh, periodically reminding your employees what those, those policies and procedures are. Additionally, identifying 
specifically uh, identifying particularly uh, sensitive positions within the organization to target those individuals for additional training. Uh, so for example, if you have certain employees within an organization that, rep that are going to be around particularly sensitive information, you target those particular employees for additional training uh, to make sure that they don't fall prey to various social engineering techniques and things like that. Business continuity and disaster recovery planning. It really starts with disaster avoidance, an approach oriented toward prevention. The idea is to minimize the chance of avoidable disasters such as fire or other human-caused threats. The idea is that you want to avoid it to begin with. If that's the case, then you never have to worry about figuring out how to continue to do business through the disaster or after the disaster getting back up to speed. If you can prevent it from ever occurring in the first place, those other issues become a moot point. The purpose of a business continuity plan is to keep the business up and running after a disaster occurs. Each function of the business should have a valid recovery capability plan. Recovery planning is part of, the, part of an asset protection. Every organization should assign responsibility to managers to identify and protect assets within the spheres of, of uh, functional control. Planning should focus first on recovery from a, a total loss of all capabilities. Proof of capability usually involves some kind of what-if analysis that shows that, recovery, that the recovery plan is current. All critical applications must be identified and their recovery procedures addressed in the plan. The plan should be written so that, if it, uh, so that it will be effective in case of disaster, not just in order to satisfy the auditors. Lastly, the plan should be kept in a safe place. Copies should be given to all key managers or it should be available on the internet or, or on the intranet. The plan should be audited periodically. In other words, it's dynamic, it's not static. It's, it needs to be something that's periodically reviewed and revised as necessary as the organization changes and as threats change. Related to business continuity is the concept of risk management. And within that, there's also the idea of a cost-benefit analysis. In other words, how much risk are we willing to accept? Part of the risk management process includes identification of assets and estimating their value, conducting a threat assessment, conducting a vulnerability assessment, calculating the impact of each threat uh, and what it would have on, on each asset, and identifying, selecting, and implementing appropriate controls. As part of the risk management analysis, we have to calculate the expected loss, and this is a, a, a calculation based on the probability of an attack occurring in the first place, the probability of that attack actually being successful, and then the loss that we would incur if that attack were successful. Once we've been able to create that, that calculation, then we're able to actually calculate the cost of our fraud prevention system. Implementing any security program is going to raise some ethical issues. For example, uh, if we start to incur or, or start to utilize various monitoring tools on our network, we may raise the ire of some of our employees, or in some cases, some external groups that, that suggest that we might be violating uh, freedom of speech or other civil rights issues. So we have to be cognizant of that when we're when we're thinking about the various measures or controls that we're we're wanting to put in place. We have to balance those against the needs and wants of our employees. Section 9.10, Implementing Enterprise-Wide E-Commerce Security, starts out by talking about the drivers of e-commerce security management. This includes proliferating worldwide laws and regulations, the complexity of global organizations due to outsourcing, an ever-increasing emphasis on the value of intangible information assets, new and faster technologies, and the often brutal competition in the global marketplace. One of the most important things in terms of implementing security within an organization uh, is having strong commitment from management. The idea that the tone at the top really kind of sets the tone for the rest of the organization. So a genuine and well-communicated executive commitment about e-commerce security and privacy measures is needed to convince users that, that insecure practices, risky or unethical methods, and mistakes due to ignorance will not be tolerated. 
The idea is to ultimately build what's known as a unified front, such that we, there's a consistent tone throughout the organization regarding security. A unified participatory process that includes everybody in the organization, a unified front, to solve the security problem. So with all this emphasis on e-commerce security, why is it difficult to stop internet crime? Well, one reason is that by if we become too restrictive with respect to security, it makes shopping inconvenient. So that's certainly an issue. There's the lack of cooperation from credit card issuers and ISPs, particularly foreign ones. They really don't have any incentive to really participate. There's shopper negligence. Individuals just don't pay attention to the information that they're putting out there. And then there's ignoring e-commerce security best practices. The book refers to a study put out, or a survey put out by CompTIA, the Computing Technology Industry Association, and they talk about a lot of organizations that simply um, um, fail to follow a lot of the best practices, such as business continuity plans and disaster recovery plans. Another reason it's difficult to establish e-commerce uh, security is some of the design and architecture issues. Uh, that exist. Um, for example, uh, in designing an e-commerce solution, a lot of times the emphasis is placed on getting the solution up and running uh, and adding on security after the fact. And as a result, we end up with what's referred to as a band-aid effect. Uh, and we're much better off to be thinking about security from the very beginning and having security built into the application. And yet that doesn't tend to be the norm. So that design, that initial design and architecture uh, perspective tends to, to play a role as well. And lastly, the lack of due care in business practices. In some cases, we, we you know, have poor hiring practices or we design poor procedures. We outsource certain critical uh, um, components to, an or to our organization. Or in some cases, we develop par business partnerships that may not be the best partnerships. And as a result, we end up compromising our customer data, intellectual property, and things like that. So in this chapter, we talked about e-commerce security, um, security issues. And some of the managerial issues that are faced with that are, well, what are some of the best e-commerce security strategies for your particular company? It's going to be different for your company. It's going to be different for your industry. Is the budget for e-commerce security adequate? The answer is going to be no, but how close are you to having an adequate budget? What steps should businesses follow in establishing a security plan? Usually following a methodical approach tends to do much better because you're able to have reproducible results. Once you have reproducible results, you can then start to identify where you're failing and you can go back and improve in those particular areas. Should organizations be concerned with internal security threats? Absolutely. I think the book talks about roughly half of uh, uh, threats originating from internal workers. This is something that's been historically true 
Um, and while threats really are kind of all around, internal threats pose a, a unique threat that, that have to be um, accounted for. And lastly, what is the key to establishing strong e-commerce e security? Really having strong leadership and having that leadership um, establish strong security procedures and policies and adhering to them themselves so that the, the support can grow from the top down throughout the organization. So after reading this chapter, you should have a pretty good idea of some of the keys to establishing a strong e-commerce security uh, implementation. You should have a basic idea of e-commerce security issues and terminology. You should have a pretty good, good idea about the threats, vulnerabilities, and technical attacks. You should know what internet fraud and phishing and spam are. You should understand what information assurance is. You should know what securing e-commerce access control and communications means. You should know what some of the technologies for protecting networks are. You should know the different controls and special defense mechanisms. You should be able, have some idea of how to protect yourself from fraud. You should know the role of business continuity and disaster recovery planning. You should understand and appreciate enterprise-wide e-commerce security. And you should know why it's impossible to stop computer crimes. This concludes Chapter 9, E-Commerce Security and Fraud Protection. Thank you.